actually, because they took my passports. Of course, I'm not going to stop for investigations. But yes, you're right that uh, many, many journalists are I now living in Russia. Annoying. I think that actually this is uh, not a bad choice because if you are an investigative journalist, it doesn't matter where you're working from. We in the Insider have, I think, like half of our staff already working from Europe. And uh, you can't even tell by reading the Insider which article was written by the journalist who was writing from Russia and which was written somewhere, I don't know, in Montenegro. It's interesting. You and I met in Moscow two years ago. We spoke about your bold investigation into the perpetrators of the Novichok poisoning of Sergei Skripal in the UK. And at the time, you expressed to me your determination to investigate the Kremlin as deeply as you felt you needed to. I'm just wondering, you and I are speaking again just the day after your apartment was searched and you were arrested. One might have thought you'd want to keep a lower profile today anyway. Why did you decide to speak? Well, I think it's obvious that the best strategy to be safe is to be in the middle of attention. So if you say out loud everything that you want, sometimes it is more safe than to keep low profile because if something happens with you immediately, everybody starts to speak about this. That's what we saw yesterday when after my arrest, all the Russian independent media started to write about this and uh, lots of people really paid attention. Roman, what's next for you? How worried are you about how the Kremlin might try and restrict your work further? Well, I don't know, because you never know when they just try to harass you and to make you feel afraid or demotivated, or when they're seriously ready to eliminate and arrest you. So I'm trying just not to think about this and just keep doing my job. Roman Dobrohotov is the editor-in-chief of the Russian news publication The Insider, speaking with us just a day after his arrest and release in Moscow. Roman, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. When we think of deserts, we normally don't think of Europe. Technically, the continent has only three, but climate change and human activity are changing that. Southern Spain, for example, is in danger of being transformed into European desert number four. Today on The Big Fix, we look at an effort to prevent that. Change is coming. Can we turn this around? We have no other option. What we do now will profoundly affect the next few thousand years. For years in southern Spain, an NGO has been working with farmers to keep the region green. Reporter Jerry Haddon reports on two men in an olive-growing region in Andalusia yeah. working together to fend off a wasteland. <laughs> Biologist Fernando Bautista and farmer Agustin Bermejo traverse a mountainside on a blazing hot morning this spring. This used to be a forest. Now there's nothing but low, dry grass and stubby bushes. The vegetation natural, cada vez. There's less and less natural vegetation, says Bautista, who grew up near here. I've watched the water disappear from rivers, he says, from rivers that never used to run dry. They're running dry because it's hotter here now, it rains less, and human activity, from farming to felling trees, is making it worse. Sort of sounds like a desert. It isn't yet. These two guys are trying to keep these hills from reaching the tipping point by making them green again. It's part of an ambitious Greenbelt project launched in 2016. The idea is to create a series of contiguous forests that would run for hundreds of miles across Spain's south. Their work starts with planting saplings, placed randomly to mimic nature. Today's work, counting how many have survived their first winter. Bermejo and Bautista crouch every few feet to inspect the three-inch tall plants. This one's damaged but alive, says Bermejo, picking a notepad with a pen. So far, about 95% of the saplings have survived. That's good news, but Bautista admits it will take decades to create a green belt. But the thing he's most passionate about, stopping erosion so rich topsoil can absorb more water, that can start now. In the nearby province of Jaén, Bermejo watches part of the problem roll by. A tractor dragging a long mechanical rotor brush through the olive orchards. Bermejo covers his face with his shirt. The dust kicked up. It's like a mini sandstorm. That dust is topsoil. 
Se produce una compactación por el mismo efecto. Look at the earth after the tractor passes, Bermejo says. The brushes break up the surface of the soil, which increases erosion and less rain gets absorbed. To convince his neighbors to change their ways, Bermejo tries to set an example. Around his own olive trees, he lets the native grasses and flowers grow wild. This prevents erosion and keeps his soil rich in organic matter. Hace diez años, pues a mí me trataban casi que de loco. Ten years ago, he says, they thought I was crazy for letting the vegetation grow. Today, my neighbors see that my trees are just as productive. He lives along the banks of a river that he's left lush and untouched. It's an improbably green oasis amidst the endless, dry expanses of olive trees. Bermejo knows his vision of a great green Andalusia is far off. But this is where he likes to pass on his most important message. El consumidor tiene mucho más poder del que... Consumers have more power than they think, he says. They need to demand more environmentally sustainable products. As for Bautista, he brings his message directly to farmers via workshops like this one in their fields. Save the soil, he says, and you'll save southern Spain from becoming a desert. Salvo que estés de viaje en Egipto. Unless you're on vacation in Egypt, he says, no one wants to see an eroded desert pop up where there shouldn't be one. Bautista's and Bermejo's work faces lots of obstacles. For example, getting private landowners to join them in rewilding their land. But they find inspiration back up on that denuded mountainside. There, a lone, immense juniper offers a glimpse of the region's past. It's more than a thousand years old. He's a survivor, Bautista says, and a glimpse of the future. A potential future, Bautista cautions. He thinks it's too late to completely stop climate change. The question is whether these trees, both large and small, can withstand the coming changes. If not, the desert will have most likely won. For the world, I'm Jerry Haddon, Andalusia, Spain. You're listening to The World. Supported by Peaceful Past Domestic Abuse Network. Presenting Back to School Bingo Night at High Dive Downtown this Sunday evening from 5 to 8. Fun for the whole family with proceeds benefiting the work of Peaceful Paths. More at PeacefulPaths.org under events. Artistry Woo! Introducing Bonnie E. Peaceful! I'm a just Woo! person. Just tell me, don't philosophize. I'd just like to see what I see. <laughs> I do realistic watercolors. I was encouraged to do abstract at a very early age, and I didn't care for that. I like the realism. I like to do paintings of people actually working their job and not paying any attention to me, uh, not pose, just being themselves. So never slowing down that, as long as I can hold a paintbrush. <laughs> Artistry in Motion is brought to you by Neighborhood Storage, serving Marion County for more than 40 years. I will be I'm Marco Werman. You're with the world. The biggest trial in the I history am? of the Vatican opened in Rome this week. At the heart of the case, a powerful former cardinal who was once a close ally of Pope Francis, along with 10 suspects accused of crimes ranging from extortion and embezzlement to money laundering and abuse of office. Some say the trial could be a turning point for the Vatican in its effort to be more open about how it conducts its finances. Here's the world's Europe correspondent, Orla Barry. A photograph of Pope Francis hangs on the wall of the courtroom in the Vatican where this week's trial began. Behind the three judges is a large crucifix. Ten defendants are on trial, but it's one man that's really centre stage. Cardinal Antonio Becciu. He's the highest ranking church official to ever face charges in a Vatican criminal court. And he says he's done nothing wrong. Speaking outside the courtroom, Becciu said he was hopeful the judges would see that he's innocent. The former cardinal was sacked by the Pope last year. The trial centres around a dodgy property deal in a posh London neighbourhood. The Vatican invested over $400 million in a luxury apartment development, but the price was vastly inflated, and the Vatican oh, lost millions. Course. At the time, Petru was seen as the one it's controlling the purse strings, and the prosecutors want to know if he was aware of just how bad the investment was. 
ultimately there's a question here about some of these Vatican so officials. The were they simply Catholic. dumb or were they crooked or were they both? <laughs> Thomas Rees is a Jesuit priest and senior analyst with Religion News Service. He says it's hard to stress just how powerful Spanish, a figure Becci was in the Vatican. Italian, Before he became a cardinal, he was an archbishop and was the equivalent of chief of they, staff they like to of be the Catholic Pope. For some reason. I mean, this is like being chief of staff in the White House. <laughs> in fact, this is a cardinal who like thought alcohol. he had a good chance of becoming Pope. Becci was also accused of funneling money into charities run by his brother in Sardinia. The former cardinal claims the trial is all part of a sinister plot against him. And he does seem to have plenty of enemies. Ines San Martin is Rome bureau chief with Catholic news website The Crux. There are a lot of people who didn't like him, both within the Italian church and, you know, the well, church as a whole. She says there's no actual working. evidence of a dark plot, though. Alongside Becciu, nine others, including Vatican officials and two Italian investment brokers, have also been charged. And there's one woman, Cecilia Marogna a mysterious figure who was hired by Cardinal Becciu in 2016 as a so-called security consultant. Bank records show more than $600,000 was transferred from the Vatican to Marania's account. She claims the money was intended as a ransom payment to free a Colombian nun kidnapped in Africa. But Ine San Martin says there appears to be a few holes in her story. The problem is there's been absolutely no update on the religious sister from Colombia. And, you know, there's evidence that shows that her company used the money instead of negotiating for the nun to be released.